So welcome to lecture 19 of MCS uh, 472 on industrial mathematics and computation. So the goal of today is to present uh, some mathematical models of problems in uh, economy, either the small or the large. So this lecture is aimed uh, very much to get at some interesting uh, topics for projects, uh, computational and mathematical. At the same time, I will try to be self-contained and introduce the most commonly used uh, definitions in economy. Okay, so we start uh, with microeconomy. Uh, we will define supply, demand, revenue, cost, profit, elasticity. Then at the larger scale, so in the beginning we consider one producer, but then we consider the price setting mechanisms uh, for many uh, producers. Okay. Um, we consider one market um, now with a single commodity and um, the demand depends on a single function uh, given a price how many quantities or how many units of a certain quantity are being offered at that price um, the demand function will be decrease as the price increases uh, related to demand is supply. A supply function determines how many units of a certain good a supplier or a producer is willing to provide at a given price. And uh, as the price increases, so the supply will increase. So we consider one single commodity, and that single commodity is governed by a demand function and a supply function. Both of them are in function of price, and they return the quantity. Now, um, in economy, it's common to put on the horizontal axis the quantity and the price on the vertical axis. So one often needs to uh, look a little bit uh, different at these plots. Um, so if you look at um, demand function, uh, which is actually hyperbola, uh, a piece of a hyperbola, so 2 over p, then if you plot this, uh, you swap the p for q, so q equals 2 over p, or p equals 2 over q. Uh, for the supply function, we have a linear supply function, so q equals p minus 1. So the supply function, if you have to plot it in function of the quantity, it becomes 1 plus q. So you see that uh, the red uh, supply goes up and the blue demand goes down. Um, or you could also see that uh, the uh, upward going supply means that as the price goes up, the quantity goes up. So the quantity is proportional with the price in the supply function. In the demand, and here's where a hyperbola might be very appropriate, the demand um, actually decreases, so it's inversely proportional as the price increases. Okay, so there is the intersection point. Uh, that's the equilibrium. Uh, so the equilibrium price is the price where demand and supply are equal to each other. Um, so that is an important uh, part. Um, so that's actually the natural state. Uh, if the price is larger than the equilibrium, what will happen is that there will be an oversupply. Perhaps I can uh, 
go to the next slide. So at prices above the equilibrium, there will be uh, a gap. So there will be a surplus. Uh, so there will the suppliers will the producers will supply much more than what the consumers are willing to um, buy. So there is a surplus, and that surplus will drive down prices. Um, if the prices are below the equilibrium, uh, then the consumers are willing to buy much more of the goods than what is supplied by the uh, producers. And this scarcity will lift up the prices. So there is a, under the assumption of the monotonely increasing uh, pro, uh, supply function and the nicely uh, decreasing uh, demand function. Um, yes, so the increasing demand function. Uh, I'm sorry, so the increasing supply function and the decreasing demand function. So look back at this picture. If you have a picture like this, then there is the natural convergence to the equilibrium. Okay, um, what is the effect of a sales tax? Uh, so the sales tax is paid by the consumer. And one can say that this will not affect the producer, but that is wrong. Uh, what happens is that uh, the demand function changes. So the demand function uh, determines how many units uh, the consumer is willing to buy at a given price, but now actually the price goes up. Uh, so if there's a tax of 10%, then the tax goes up, uh, then the price for the consumer goes up by 10%. So then actually you should read the demand function as the demand function not for the original price P, but for the price increased by 10%. So the formula for the demand function is written here then at the percent wise uh, sales tax. It's the same demand function. So the characteristics of the product haven't really changed. So that's also an assumption that we are making here. Um, so th there is the um, increased uh, price and that will lead to a decrease in the amount and that will affect the producer as well so here is the plot uh, so for the same numerical example of the simplistic hyperbola so we have 2 over p that now becomes 2 over p plus t times p and i took 10 percent tax uh, to uh, show the shift in the demand of the plot you see that there is a decrease in the demand there will also then be a new equilibrium so this is where it will affect the producer so the price will effectively come down and also the amount of quantities uh, being uh, produced that's why it's often uh, you see higher sales taxes on goods where the, uh, the, the the amount of quantity consumed, like tobacco and liquor, that one wants to reduce uh, that. So in, in some sense, the government wants to raise uh, revenue, uh, but also the side effect might be that wants to reduce the consumption of certain goods. Um, here is the first exercise. So we've seen a tax on the uh, consumer, uh, but say in tobacco, uh, the government may want to levy a tax on the producer. Uh, suppose that on a package of cigarettes, the producer then must pay uh, $1 per package. Um, so we have these simple uh, supply and demand functions. Uh, so the first part of this exercise, you can answer by solving a linear system. Uh, for the second, so the, 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 the 
the main point of this exercise is actually that you have to redo the um, supply function uh, similarly uh, to the uh, change in the demand function. So the price for the producer, so we have the supply, what the producer is willing to offer at a certain price, but now the price actually drops. Um, no, um, yeah, the price in, indeed drops. So from one unit, say one package of cigarettes, the producer must give one dollar to the government. So that will lead to the the, the, the the price goes down, so then also the supply must go down. Um, and that will have an effect on the consumer. Uh, so uh, the tax is actually shift, so the, the tax, even though it will be levied on the producer, but it will have an effect on the consumer. Um, All right, uh, revenue, cost, and profit. Uh, so, given the um, pr the price for every unit and the quantities that are sold at this price, then the revenue is simply the product, uh, the, the the price multiplied with the quantity solved. Um, it will be a rectangle, as we will see geometrically. Uh, the Revenue is not always equal to profit as there is a cost to produce every unit. Um, so there is also a fixed cost um, associated with this. So this is the cost with producing zero units. Um, and the profit is uh, revenue minus cost. Okay, um, we have the geometric so we saw the equilibrium uh, we can uh, visualize also the revenue as an area uh, so the revenue is the price times the quantity solved and this is here shown by the green rectangle so for the equilibrium price uh, so the effect then on the sales tax, so I didn't make the plot, uh, but the sales tax uh, makes that the equilibrium price drops. So in, in a way, a, a sales tax, uh, you would say the price drops, so there would be more consumed, but actually the uh, decrease in revenue is, is actually uh, also um, gives a rise to a public sector revenue. Um, now, um, so you see that the effect of a sales tax also has an impact on the producer. Um, so also the, it is the size of the tax that also matters. Uh, so the uh, effect of a sales tax can also work, um, also succeeds uh, thus in reducing the amount of quantity so, uh, consumed. Um, so it, it's, it's in that sense also can be used to conserve, so to, to the effect of a sales tax now levied on the consumer can lead to a conservation effort if the uh, government wants to uh, dampen uh, consumption of certain goods. Sales tax can also have that effect. As well. All right, um, we strive for optimal uh, profit, not, not for optimal revenue. Um, so looking at uh, revenue only uh, might be, uh, is, is actually not the right uh, way to look at it. So from within a producer, one single producer, so we are now doing really microeconomics, 
we look at uh, the marginal cost, uh, we consider should we produce one extra item. So how much does it cost more to produce? Uh, so, and you can answer this by a derivative. Um, so if the slope of the cost function is uh, too steep, then you will not produce your extra item. If, on the other hand, the cost function uh, has a very mild slope, then yes, indeed, it just doesn't cost much for um, to produce one more unit. But actually, you also make the same consideration for the revenue. So if the revenue uh, has a positive slope, and uh, then you have an incentive to produce that uh, extra unit. If, if the slope is steeper than the cost, then actually you will produce more. Is the slope of the revenue is less than the slope of the cost, then it relatively costs more than what you bring in uh, from revenue to produce that extra item. So, in a way, I have hand-wavingly um, explained uh, the proof uh, for the theorem at which quantity occurs the optimal profit. So, the optimal profit occurs when the derivative of the cost function equals the derivative of the revenue function. So, at that point. Um, you can prove this theorem by contradiction. Suppose that you are not at the optimum. Then there are two cases. Either the slope is larger, slope of the revenue is larger than the slope of the cost. So the, the marginal revenue is larger than the marginal cost. Then you will produce more. So if the equation is not hold, then you're not at the equilibrium. Uh, at the other case, uh, if the marginal revenue is less than the marginal cost, you would do well to produce less. And also there, you are not at the optimum. Okay, here is the numerical example uh, for a linearly increasing revenue function uh, and a parabolic cost function. Uh, you see that uh, you, we can uh, just apply the theorem, the bottom line does this, so the derivatives are very easy to compute. We see that the optimal quantity to produce is 2.5, and you can see the slope of the blue curve is always 5, but the if you would bring the blue curve down, so then you would see that at the point 2.5, it would nicely touch the red curve. If you just bring the blue curve uh, shifted down uh, a certain quantity so that it touches, so that becomes a, a tangent line to the optimal quantity that needs to be produced. Okay, so one can uh, motivate uh, calculus uh, with economy. So uh, the reason to study uh, calculus is also to uh, be uh, very economical. Um, so here are uh, some other um, important uh, concepts. Uh, the elasticity of demand. Uh, so um, we've seen how to op to to determine the optimal quantity a producer should um, produce. Um, given that, um, but that quantity, so it depends also at the demand. So we looked at the optimal uh, product um, from the revenue perspective, but let's look at it from a demand perspective. Demand is a factor in the revenue. So we can uh, write revenue uh, in the price uh, function. And then we ask ourselves, 
uh, what is the elasticity of the demand? Um, so it's negative. So the elasticity is defined also as a derivative. How much does demand change as price changes? So in general, we will always have that as the price goes up, the demand goes down. down. So this is why it, ha it occurs with a negative sign. Uh, but by, by how much? Um, okay, let's define elasticity. So um, the elasticity um, can be defined as we did before as the change in demand over the change in price. So we have this uh, ratio that we can express in terms of the uh, demand function. So we have the change in demand over the change in price, uh, which can be expressed by derivatives. Uh, so we are going to have the derivative, the demand function in there. So the demand function is uh, replaces Q. Uh, the, so we have the denominator, the first denominator, uh, Q gets replaced by the demand function. Then we have the change in demand, which can be expressed as the difference in the uh, demand uh, as a consequence of changing the price. Um, so that gives then the derivative. So that is approximated by the derivative. So that's the last factor in uh, this expression here. So we can define then the elasticity as a function of price. Okay, what does this uh, do for us? Well, um, what is the change in revenue as the uh, price uh, changes? So we have uh, defined revenue as price times quantity solved. The quantity is defined by the demand function uh, in function of price. So we take that product and take the derivative with respect to the price. The price uh, function, um, then we can find out that the uh, change in revenue can be expressed as the demand function times 1 minus the elasticity. So we see that the revenue now depends on the demand, but also on the elasticity of the demand. So how does the demand change as the price is changing? Okay, so we define the elasticity as uh, the change in revenue over demand. So we can have that the revenue decreases as the price increases. Um, so then actually the demand is elastic. Um, but actually we want, we don't want that case. Uh, we want that the revenue increases when the price increases. And in that case, the demand is inelastic. Um, so the optimum will happen, the optimal revenue will happen when the uh, value for E, the elasticity, equals 1. In that sense, we have the optimal revenue. So this is a situation where we have a monopoly, very unrealistic. So this is the price setting of a monopolistic situation. Okay, so this was the microeconomy. Um, so uh, an exercise, um, what is the elasticity for the linear demand function and for which price is the revenue then optimal? Uh, is the uh, elasticity equal to 1. Okay, I mentioned that monopoly is rather unrealistic, also undesirable, certainly on the perspective of a consumer. 
So let's look at uh, duopolistic uh, competition. So when there are two producers, and we will also derive theories of uh, competition. And that will lead to some very interesting mathematics and mathematical models. Uh, so um, we had to go through some terminology, but I hope that this terminology pays off. Um, consider uh, a model that was proposed by Cournot in which we consider two competing producers. Uh, they produce the same product and we assume that the demand function is the same. Uh, so uh, let's say that with bottled water you don't really differentiate um, between uh, who produces uh, the bottle of water. Water is water. Um, oh, some people may disagree here, but that seems to be logical. Um, okay, so the assumption of Cournot is that uh, the output uh, will be, um, so every each producer believes that the other will hold its output constant. Now, what is now the price setting mechanism? So in a monopoly, we've seen that the elasticity determines uh, the uh, price for which the profit is optimized. Um, what is it in a duopoly? So we assume to answer this, we assume that there is some uh, a leader and a follower. Um, we discretize the problem and assume that the uh, com first competitor comes first, it has a monopoly, uses the demand function to determine the price with the elasticity equal to 1. So uh, the demand function then actually changes. Uh, so when the uh, competitor comes in, uh, the competitor works then with a revised uh, demand function where the quantity that is provided by A is subtracted. Um, so also B determines then the price using the same uh, model for the elasticity using the modified demand function. Okay, so far so good. What we can do then is we can uh, rewrite the formulas into a discrete time system in which the derivative appears. So the price setting mechanism for the second competitor, so the follower, can then be written as a differential uh, equation, if you like, so with a derivative sitting in there. So B1 is a solution of this equation. Uh, for A, uh, A has to react to this. Uh, there will be a new demand curve. So the demand is now changing by the quantities offered by B1. And A has to adjust its price according to this formula. Okay, so now it gets very interesting. So we have uh, with this model of a leader and a follower, where we have an initial starting condition, the assumption of the leader, then we can look for uh, solutions of this uh, model here. So we have that the price for the follower is determined by this equation, and also for the leader then. So uh, I have indicated here that there is an index k. So the k equals 1 uh, was the case of the previous slide. Now one can uh, rerun this um, model in a fixed point iteration. So if the equations are contractive, then this will converge to an equilibrium. Uh, and it can be seen as a fixed point iteration. So we've encountered fixed point iterations in numerical analysis, uh, and we've seen that we can uh, construct all kinds of initial point.
point uh, iterations and we also formulated um, a condition for which there is a, a converging equilibrium uh, so at the equilibrium the slope should be less than one so uh, the purpose of studying these discrete time systems here is that uh, the it's no longer intersecting the diagonal with a nonlinear function but we are actually intersecting two nonlinear systems but the same principle can be applied um, All right, uh, let's do this for, again, linear demand function uh, for which it will converge or on the, are there conditions actually for which it converges and uh, what is the equilibrium uh, price. Okay, uh, so we are more than halfway. We still have two topics to consider. Um, two topics uh, from uh, macroeconomy. So we consider uh, an entire economy um, where the output of the entire economy is determined by two factors, labor and capital. And there is a technology coefficient A and a parameter alpha. Uh, so it's a nonlinear model where the alpha is uh, kind of a weighing factor between labor and capital. Um, so whether um, and why is that so beneficial? Well, um, this is a model that leads to a homogeneous equation. Um, what does this mean if you multiply labor and capital by the same factor then you will multiply the output of the production as can be verified from this simple calculation here if you go through these equations you can verify that the factor by which you multiplied labor and capital will actually also uh, multiply the uh, total production. So if you double both labor and capital, that will double the output. And that is independent of these parameters A and alpha, which is kind of neat. Okay, um, but there are other issues with this model, um, other applications. So uh, we can ask, uh, should we invest in the labor force, um, invest in education uh, perhaps, or should we invest in capital, should we invest in uh, machinery, equipment? Um, let's see, what is the effect on the production of adding one extra labor, of one extra unit of labor? marginal product of labor um, which is uh, the economical uh, terminology as mathematicians we uh, interpret this immediately as taking derivatives so we have a explicit formula we take the derivative so we see that the marginal product of labor is uh, the total production defined by the labor uh, the total amount of labor multiplied by this alpha factor and uh, this is written down by the symbol W the first letter of the wage so this should uh, so this is how much one extra laborer uh, contributes to the production and that should be the wage paid to one worker Okay, so what is now the other effect on capital? Um, so how, what's the effect of one addition of extra unit of capital? Um, and the unit can be running uh, your equipment longer or having more equipment. Um, so we all will also take the derivative now, but now I 
there's a typo here it should be with respect to k not with respect to l uh, so we take the derivative of the production with respect to k and we find that uh, the marginal product of capital is the total output of the production defined by the uh, capital multiplied by this factor 1 minus alpha. Again, I should have pointed out this as was the case also in the uh, previous wage derivation. This is independent also of the technology coefficient A. Uh, the uh, letter for the marginal product of capital is uh, denoted by R. So this is should equal the rent uh, one pays for capital. Okay, so this now leads to a law. Um, so if we have uh, derived from the model, so the Q the model for production with the parameters a and alpha we derived the expressions for wage and rent then you can observe that you can construct q so we have written q in one way but you can also write q as the sum of the product of labor times the marginal uh, product of labor so the L times W plus the K times R, so the capital times the marginal product of capital. So that gives us a model for the production in terms of the wage and the rent. So that's a, a microeconomic law. And I, for that theorem, I... Uh, have this as the main uh, outcome of the Cobb Douglas model of uh, economy. So, what does that buy us? Uh, well, there is a microeconomic application. So, microeconomic now with respect to one single producer. So, as the manager of a production plant, um, you have to determine uh, in your output you model the output uh, so you have two parameters uh, so you know how, what is the input labor and uh, the capital you know um, what are the contributions there you have the two parameters that you can sample so you see if you have that many labor hours and that many hours in which you run your equipment what are the parameters a and alpha and then you can determine the application of the law uh, so with that model if you know the values for a and alpha you compute the derivatives that are going to determine the wage and the rent and if you want to increase production um, you will hire more workers if the contribution to the production of the uh, labor, the marginal product of labor, is higher than the marginal product of capital. And you do the opposite. You will going to raise more capital if the rent uh, coefficient is higher than the wage coefficient. We have no exercise on this. Um, uh, the last model is uh, an input-output model. So it's also a macroeconomic model um, where we have three sectors and we have a consumer sector. So we have agriculture, industry and service, the three major sectors. Um, we have equations, linear equations, and it is a linear model. Uh, for every unit of goods, for all goods that are produced by agriculture, so the X1 represents the output of the agriculture, 30% uh, goes back to agriculture, is consumed by agriculture, 20% is consumed by industry, 
30% is consumed by surface. And then uh, the C is the demand of the consumer sector. Um, so uh, you have these three sectors, uh, but then there is also the consumption sector. So uh, there is of the production, how much that flows back into uh, the three sectors. But then the purpose of these three sectors is not that they sustain themselves, but that also you can uh, bring food at the table for the consumers. Um, we can express similar equations. Uh, so these are kind of here, uh, this is a numerical example. So we can write this as a single matrix relation. Uh, all the coefficients here are positive. And the demand of the consumer sector is represented by this vector B. It's called the bill of goods. Uh, so if you have this model of input output of your economy, um, can you realize uh, the consumer demand expressed by the consumer wants four units of agriculture, four, five units of industry, 12 units of the service sector. Is this bill of goods realizable? Uh, so the main reason for this model is that it brings us back into the world of numerical linear algebra. Um, if we solve this equation, uh, then we essentially consider an eigenvalue problem. Um, you can see the inverse of the, well, the, 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 the matrix then also uh, better be invertible. This, uh, so we bring the A times X to the other side, and then we take the inverse and look at the series expansion. So this inverse uh, makes sense if the right hand side converges. So if you take products of matrices and that doesn't start to diverge. Um, and this happens if the matrix uh, has all its eigenvalues less than one. So the interesting aspect about this model is that it is determined entirely not by the uh, bill of goods by the vector B, but it is actually determined by this coefficient matrix A, whether that matrix, as matrix of positive numbers, has all its eigenvalues less than 1. So this is also the nice thing about this model. Okay, um, so this was, uh, the, the, the purpose of this lecture was to provide uh, interesting mathematical models of markets, of price settings mechanisms, um, and we considered also some models in make macroeconomy. So this was an overview of one entire chapter of the textbook that we are following in this course. Through our UIC library, uh, you can pick up online versions of two interesting uh, books. Um, we mentioned the Cournot model uh, of duopolistic uh, competition. Uh, this Cournot model already appears very early in a book on game theory. Uh, so game theory is an important branch, both in economy, but also in economics. Uh, the last, uh, the, the, the second reference, uh, additional reference, other than our textbook, um, has a nice title, it's a nonlinear world, and it provides very nice descriptions of nonlinear models. Um, the price setting mechanism is um, a, a model of competition. So the, in, there is an entire chapter that is... Um, entirely devoted to models of competition. Okay, the purpose of this lecture was to get to interesting uh, topics for projects. Um, so the first prob topic 
is both mathematical and computational. Uh, it's also economical. So the concept of a Nash equilibrium uh, is very important in game theory in the sense that every undergraduate in economics uh, knows this concept. And uh, it's also very interesting uh, mathematically. So the purpose of uh, we haven't centrally already encountered uh, the Cournot model is one specific can can also often is a specific type of equilibrium uh, so also occurs um, in a book on game theory so the purpose of this project is uh, mainly that you get some where a good idea of what is a Nash equilibrium and formulate a computationally and economically interesting model where this occurs now, um, I may have suggested this uh, a little bit flippantly when we started with linear programming, that uh, with supply and demand, there's often, also you could have guessed this a little bit at the beginning of the lecture, we had very simplistic models uh, for supply and demand function. So there is a unique equilibrium, but actually it does not have to be that way. Uh, so the purpose of this uh, project is also to come up with an interesting example where there can be many equilibria. So uh, in a nonlinear world, um, you must assume that you have uh, many equilibria. Um, so it can actually even get uh, worse. Um, so in competition, uh, one can uh, come up with computational models that lead to chaos. Um, so the chapter 11 uh, of the nonlinear world um, gives a nice example of, um, of a model that leads to chaos. Um, so the question here is, can a price war ever lead to something like this? Uh, so again, if we choose our functions uh, a certain to a certain model, um, is it possible actually that chaos may occur? Um, so um, with that, I hope that I have succeeded in uh, showing that economy um, can lead to extremely interesting uh, mathematical problems. And the purpose of uh, this part of the course is to suggest uh, interesting uh, computational projects that also broaden a little bit the uh, mathematical horizon. So thank you for uh, listening to this lecture.